Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm so pleased to join you all. And you have a very good topic. And uh, stem me with shock. What should we treat first, a shock or myocardial infarction? So, sorry, I just want to advance my slides. Um, it's my conflicts of interest. Now, should we treat, uh, we've been trying to treat STEMI, we've all been doing that. And of course, if you get there early enough, almost no infarction, and therefore you can avoid shock. So the reperfusion therapies we talked about is fibrinolysis, and even in Australia, many rural areas get fibrinolysis, ultra-metropolitan, and the other is uh, primary PCI. We know, we've heard the primary PCI for STEMI is time sensitive, resource intensive, potentially life-saving. It demands a lot of organization to be treating the whole country and trying to give, deliver care to everyone who lives in your country in the rural and in metropolitan areas. Now, this is a very famous graph from Bernard Gersh, and you can see that if you move and reduce the time it takes, if you move from a point A to point B, you're not doing a lot of benefit because you're still too far. It's time sensitive. You need to get there early to open up your infarct-related artery to get benefit. Notice there's a mortality reduction in C and D. So moving from B to C, there's a huge benefit in, reduce, in the reduction of mortality. It's very time sensitive. We have these global initiatives like Stent Save a Life. Recognize your symptoms, act quickly, get emergency services, receive your treatment, particularly prime PCI. You can see here that this is uh, from Tim Henry uh, from Minnesota, and it's a network. In this state of the United States, they actually transferred by helicopter 73% of the patients for a STEMI service. And most of this strategy is pharmacoinvasive. Look, Mayo Clinic area, notice the mortality now is 3.7 to 7.2%, depending on how quickly you can get to your primary PCI or reperfusion therapy. And part of this is a fibrinolysis in the regional areas. We looked at this in Australia, and I'll show you some interesting things. If you optimize your emergency medical services, you will improve access. But if you open a new PC, primary PCI center, you cannibalize your fibrinolysis. You change what it would have, would have treated. You're minus 3.7% in fibrinolysis, and you change into primary PCI. But you don't know if there's a great delay because you've got a new center. If you transfer from one hospital to another hospital for primary PCI, notice that the fibrinolysis changes to a primary PCI strategy. 23% would have been treated with uh, TNK or, or, uh, or STK. TPA would change to primary PCI. A direct transfer where all patients in one area get transferred, uh, you'd also change your fibrinolysis treatment into primary PCI. But the question is, are you delivering care? You need to look at that very carefully. One of the things that are very beneficial is pre-hospital fibrinolysis. Notice that you can get a lot of people treated because they're so far out and deliver the medication in the ambulance. And that's very, very useful for timely reperfusion. We looked at this and we published recently in the European Heart Journal about late treatment. Notice that these patients who are late treated PCI versus scheduled PCI have a problem with the comp composite endpoint, MACE events, and mortality is increased. So if you have a primary PCI service in your network and you can't get your patients to the PCI center, you're doing them harm. And the pharmacoinvasive here actually does pretty well so you have to be careful what you're doing. So pharmacoinvasive, scheduled PCI, rescue PCI is going to be better if you have a primary PCI service that's not delivering the patients quickly enough from hospital transfer. Well, shock, if, you, if you're infarcting and you can get shock, a state of uh, your organs not develop, uh, gaining enough perfusion from your heart. You can have an altered mental status, lactic acidosis, pulmonary congestion, hypotension. Not all shock is left ventricular related. There's right ventricular shock. There are other reasons, sometimes related to valve dysfunction during acute STEMI or a complications such as a ventricular septal defect. Notice the incident of shock has not changed much in the last 20 years. We're looking at something like 9%. This is in the US registry of STEMI going into shock. Now, some of them, uh, of course, non stemis can also result in shock. This is what we've been doing for the last 20 years. We have been treating myocardial infarction first because all this data came and what's very impactful has been a shock trial. Judith Hockman, now it did not make its primary endpoint of 20% difference, but notice that the infarcts are within 36 hours, they have shock, uh, and then they get randomized within 12 hours, and within six hours of randomization, 
you can have emergency revascularization. And notice that PDCA was only half the population. 40% had bypass surgery. In 150 patients who had initial medical therapy, 90% had balloon pumps. And 66% had thrombinolysis, unless contraindicated. So that's reperfusion therapy and some support. And delayed revascularization was allowed within 54 hours uh, of the randomization, only at one in four. But it translated to a mortality reduction. This is the, uh, between early revascularization and medical therapy, there is a significant mortality reduction at one year. And this is mostly in people under the age of 75 and not much in the older patients, purportedly from their comorbidities. There was no interaction with gender, early randomization, anterostemia, diabetes, hypertension, US site, transfer or fibrinolytic group. And you can see that, that they were less heart failure too. This is what driven all of us. So what, how, how have we, what's a report card? What have we been doing for the last 20 years since the shock trial? And this is it, nothing has changed. Mortality has been around one in two, 50%. Sometimes it's 40%, but it's around 50%. Do we save patients? Occasionally we do with a balloon pump, but a lot of them die. One in two would die. And sometimes they die after their uh, hospitalization, this post-discharge. What has happened is that uh, we looked at how we define shock in the trials and it's very heterogeneous. And in fact, we now recognize that early recognition of shock where you're doing your STEMI primary PCI is very important. And the sky uh, stages of shock are very useful because they're very, very helpful in describing this. And notice that the, the action really is stage B, beginning of shock, and classic. A lot of the time, if they're deteriorating stage D or extreme, they're probably likely to do very poorly regardless of what you do. And maybe there's not much to do in small hospitals, and maybe you may not even have a balloon pump or an ICU service. But let's look at this. It's been refined recently. The Sky actually has a cardiogenic shock working group looking at this, and that one thing that's changed, they've added hypoperfusion, and they've started a registry, the third version has captured 3,500 patients. What's interesting is Sky B is not beginning. Sky B is bad. So Sky B in a new definition, the working group, is very bad. We'll show you why it's bad. Why is it bad? Because Sky B in a new definition working group registry of 3,500 patients, 3, patients is that they, esc they get escalated. They will deteriorate. 90% of them will deteriorate versus all of these like sky, uh, stage C, uh, sky stage C, 68%. But look at the mortality. Mortality is really terrible. Uh, you may ignore the heart failure. It's not part of this talk. The heart failure shock also has mortality, but the infarct shock is very high, highest in the B group. Of course, most these would die anyway. Well, what else can we do? We can treat the shock. What are the options? Well, they're expensive, some of them. And even balloon pumps have a cost involved intra-aortic balloon pump, which is the most available worldwide in most hospitals. The impeller, microaxial pump, there are, uh, this PHP, this heart pump is not available anymore, withdrawn. VA ECMO in some hospitals, usually a more tertiary referral hospital, and tandem heart in some specialized hospitals. Well, there's the pressure volume loops. We're not gonna dwell on this, but ECMO usually increases the uh, afterload and preload. Whereas a microaxial pump, like an impeller, will shift your uh, pressure volume loops into a more favorable position. There are problems with mechanical cardiac support. They're expensive, they're resource intensive, and they have associated complications such as vascular complications. Notice it's double digit and it's not small. There are major bleeding issues with these access sites and you can still stroke, particularly using ECMO. I'll just show you these randomized trials. There's not been a lot. This is from a paper from 2015 from Holger Thille, who ran IAPP shock 2. And notice that that's the mortality you see that's reduced for STEMI shock in shock trial. And look at the LVADs. There's not a lot of difference here. What are the problems with trials in this space? Is that poor recruitment, heterogeneous patients, and notice the size of the number of patients in the trials, like SMASH. Shock itself is only 300 patients. IAPB shock 2, 600 patients, and culprit shock. There's been a downgrading of balloon pumps uh, for shock because of IAPB shock 2. So it's been downgraded from level 1 to level 2 indication. 
And even locally, and this is uh, not very new, 2016, um, the National Heart Foundation of Australia and the CAC Society basically said IVB shock for ongoing cardiac shock is not shown to be uh, very good for reducing 30-day or six-month mortality and actually should be avoided. And you can see that shock um, the detection, repressors, mechanical support is clinically indicated. And extracorporeal mechanical cardiac support may allow cardiac organ and then organ recovery and assist definitive therapy. A short-term plan, mechanical support should only be considered is as a definitive plan for definitive therapy, which is difficult because sometimes it's bridged to a decision. This is the European guidelines only about a year ago, and you can see that the level of evidence is not a lot. Small randomized trials for the axial pump, such as impeller, and ECMO even does not have a lot of studies, prospective and cohort studies only. So what we've seen is that if you have a shock team organized in your hospital with intensive care, and EM, EMS, and also the heart failure doctors in your cardiology department, you actually use more, more pumps, more support, and less balloon pumps if you have more mechanical cardiac support, because they're more likely to get, add to the support. Balloon pumps offer just a, a very low degree of cardiac support, maybe a liter a minute. So these observational studies, we see that the shock teams, uh, if you have the ability to use advanced types of MCS, it does lower the risk adjusted mortality. Let's look at some registry work, and this is the US data, the Detroit Cardiac Shock Initiative, looking at cathode activation, identifying shock early, and then actually deciding on support under, 30, under 90 minutes. Once you have support, you do your primary PCI, and then a right heart catheterization is done to assess not only the uh, CPO, which is a, a measure of left ventricular performance, and also uh, PAPI, which is a pulmonary artery pulsatility index, really suggesting what the RV is doing, whether or not the RV is a uh, reason for shock, whether or not offer right ventricular support. And of course, ICU admission and reducing the number of presses or inotropes which are used, and then seeing how they're doing. What they found is that using invasive monitoring back to swan GANS catheters is useful. And impeller before you do a PCI is also useful because you're supporting all the organs and try not to go into a spiral of shock. And that's led to the, uh, um, not single center like Detroit, but a national cardiac shock initiative, which mirrors the results in the Detroit experience. And looking at that, number one is that the impeller is pre-PCI. And as Jack had just said after the last talk, is that you activate the catheter for primary PCI, but then you get access and you decide if you can figure out, are they actually in AMI shock? If it is, you place the MCS. If you don't know, perhaps you consider doing an echo or right heart catheterization and, and triage them properly. If mechanical, if mechanical cardiac support is instituted, then you do your PCI and then you assess using a right heart catheter, catheter what you're doing and then decide. Notice that in this scenario, and it's hopefully soon to be published, the survival to discharge was 71%. That is 21% more than what we've been doing, about 50% 50, 50 mortality in the last 20 years. And so decreasing invasive hemodynamic dynamic monitoring and decreasing inotropic use uh, and using support has helped reduce mortality in their experience. And if you compare to the other shock trials, these shock survival is surprisingly good. This is something we really want to achieve if this is real. And we've seen something very similar in Japan and also in Hong Kong and other jurisdictions trying to protocolize the treatment of cardiac shock and early recognition. Of course, if your CPO and your lactate is falling and your CPO is very good, you have more, survi more survival here, right? It's less than four. And uh, all of this just tells you if you're doing well. So I think the lactate is a, a, a sort of a, a, a measure. If it's falling in the next 12 to 24 hours that your organs are actually improving. And if a CPO is good, maybe you would triage into a better subgroup. So the lessons that have been learned from that experience have been an early it's not randomized trial, but an early support, in fact, pre-PCI, invasive PA catheter monitoring. Use some inotropes, but try to wean them off as much as you can, as quickly as you can. And of course, a bridge to a decision, are they gonna be palliated, is it hopeless? Do they need more support, like a VAD or transplant, or at least increase the support, uh, or ECMO even, so you have ECPELA. Randomized trials in this space, danger trial, we'll, eagerly awaited. It's taken a lot more than 10 years 
and still running, and so hopefully we'll see the data later this year from the danger shock trial. It is a trial that's looking at um, a protocol so you can actually know if you're doing well, whether you're going to escalate to escalating your support. ECMO in shock will be studied as well in the, in the ECLA shock trial. And I think that uh, we're looking at other mechanistic things, such as unloading the ventricle in the uh, door to unload trial in STEMI. These are not, not shock patients, uh, but these are actually anterior STEMIs that are going to be um, supported first before their primary PCI. So this is kind of what it looks like. And the pilot study have also already been reported three years ago and in a randomized phase currently of unloading and actually waiting for 30 minutes before they revascularize the patient for the infarct rally of the artery. Recover 4, looking at impeller support versus other protocol treatments, including other kinds of mechanocardic support for STEMI shock. And that's just going to be about underway very soon. So it'll be many years before we know this result. So I think that we have been doing uh, treating myocardial infarction very well, trying very hard to improve our systems of care. But for STEMI shock, it's still a problem. Has not changed much in the last 20 years, very high mortality rate. So the early recognition of shock, even intubating, oxygenating is helpful in some cases. Door to support perhaps with something like Impella maybe uh, will help us a lot, but we're still waiting for randomized trial data for this. But people are already instituting that and trying to achieve those results. But they're expensive, resource intensive. Shock teams, PA catheter monitoring, weaning allotropes as needed, and how to escalate or make a decision about bridging therapies. So I think I'm going to stop there. So the, the world looks like we're going to treat both STEMI and shock, but sometimes support the shock out before we even treat the STEMI. Since you're, so thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Sydney. You covered a lot of ground and a lot of information. Thanks for that. The session is open now for discussion. Any questions? Uh, maybe I can jump in first for Sydney. Um, as you know, we are, we're talking in a joint uh, session with APSC and BCSI. And um, IBP is going to be the most common uh, MCS available. What is your advice on the IBP use now in Asia PAC uh, for this space? Uh, look, I think that if that's what you've got, you've got to use it. And I think that probably we have not been using nearly as much that we ought to do. Notice that in the original shock trial, uh, it helped. And despite uh, the medical arm getting 90% balloon pumps, there was still a mortality benefit if you revascularize. So I think that's as good as it, it gets. But I think we are in a, and I think we need a little bit more data even, but we are driving to, this, to the idea that we need to support the ventricle. And we, we've always talked about support before even the PCI. So it may just be that we need to get them some support rather than, than just focus so much on open up the artery. I can totally understand we've been doing that a lot and that's the most evidence-based therapy that we've been impl uh, uh, no, instituting and trying to open up the artery. But if you get there really, really early, that's fantastic. You know, almost no, need no support, but we often don't get them that early. And so we have to be conscious of the fact that they are already a little, little bit late uh, in the infarct and if they're going to shock, I think the balloon pump goes in almost even before you put the stent in or unblock the artery because that's going to be a little bit more helpful. Now, I think that we're moving towards a stage if the costings of, a, of an impeller would be as, as much as a balloon pump, we will be adding it for sure because I think that's going to be very useful. Mm -hmm.